The following sermon is presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado. We hope you'll be strengthened and encouraged by God's Word today as you listen. Well, good morning and welcome, Southside Bible Church. And I'm as well glad for any uh, first time people who are here with us in our body. We're grateful to have you. So, special welcome. Last week, we began a new study in 2 Peter, so if you will turn with me to 2 Peter. This morning, we're going to turn our attention to verse 1. We're going to spend the morning really looking at this glorious phrase, to those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours. It's just so beautiful, and I want to open up the richness of this statement this morning to our minds and to our hearts so that the true knowledge of Christ would cause grace and peace to flow in our hearts that that Peter will cry out for in verse 2. Reminder, Peter's writing to a persecuted people. Nero is performing atrocities on the people of God and killing them and burning them. And this church is discouraged. And now they're being tempted by false teachers are, are being sown. Their teaching is being sown into the church. They're seeing sin on the rise uh, outside their community and even within their community. And Peter is seeking to help them as he sees his time on this earth now coming to an end. This is Peter's last letter, his last words to the church. So what does he say? He says, you need to realize what you already know. I want to stir you up by way of remembrance what you've already been taught. I'm not going to give you something new, uh, not a new message, but I want you to believe the old, old story. I'm going to bring up the truths of Christianity, the bedrock foundation again. You don't grow out of these, you grow into these truths. The work of a Christian minister, 20 years at Southside, I have nothing new to remind you again and again of the grace of our God because what? We forget It's amazing to me that we forget amazing grace, and we drift, and we wander, and the scene draws us away. So if you are discouraged this morning, if you are worn down, what you need is to remember. We need to stir ourselves up again to the things that we believe as Christians, the cure for whatever you are facing this morning, to realize again what we have in Jesus Christ to put your life back into perspective. And so for that, let us go to the throne of grace and ask God to reorient our minds and our hearts to the grace of God in Christ Jesus. Father, we come before you and we marvel again at the grace of Almighty God. We worship and we rejoice that the sovereign one of all is a gracious God who manifested that grace in a person, the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, as we look into his face, we see the full blazing glory of your grace. And what we're going to look at now this morning, I pray that your spirit would let every heart see the fullness of the gift of God to believe upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So meet us, we pray, Father, as we go into your word, I pray that your spirit now would illuminate it to every mind and heart so that we will be changed and transformed by our time of worship here together as the church of God. So meet us and do what no man can do by your spirit and your word alone, we pray. Amen. Well, why are we here this morning? Might be a different answer from some of the children, I hope. Uh, Why have we gathered together in this building on a Sunday? That's because we're Christians. We're Christians because of what has happened in this world and in history. Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners among who I am foremost. In 2 Peter 1, 16, Peter said, For we did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We saw it. For when we received honor and glory from God the Father, such an utterance as this was made to him by the majestic glory in that transfiguration. God said, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. 
And we ourselves heard this utterance made from heaven when we were with him on that holy mountain. That is the message of Christianity. And because of what happened, Jesus Christ, fully God, fully man, coming into the world and what he did is what makes us a Christian. And what makes us a Christian is our relationship then to that reality, our relationship to Jesus Christ. And yet as we we look at the world today, the majority do not believe this message. And so what is it then that differentiates us from this world that is full of unbelief? It's our faith. It is our faith. And Peter is going to choose an interesting word here in verse 1 for this faith at its very root word is the word precious. King James Version translates it, you've been given a precious faith. We, we don't just have a faith. We have a precious faith. And Peter says, I'm writing to you battered saints because you have received the same precious faith as me, Peter the Apostle. It's not different class citizens. We have received the same precious faith as Peter. Faith is the key that unlocks the door to all the fullness that is in Jesus Christ. And and the degree of your faith does not matter. Christ said it could be the size of a mustard seed. And so it, it is not the size of it. It's what your faith looks at. Faith, all that he requires is that you see your need of him. Peter likes this word precious. I want to take you back to our old study in 1 Peter and look at, I'm just going to read you a couple of verses in 1 Peter 1, 7. He says that this faith is going to protect us. It's going to keep us to the very end. And that faith that God has given us, he's going to He's going to stick it in furnaces and he's going to burn off unbelief and impurities and he's going to purify this faith. And in verse 7, that the the proof then of your faith, this faith that comes out of the furnace, it's more precious than gold, which is perishable even though tested by fire. This faith may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Uh, This refined faith is precious. And then in 1 Peter 2, 7, he talks about the cornerstone, Christ, is this precious value then is for you who believe. For those who disbelieve the stone which the builders rejected, this became the very cornerstone. And so this preciousness of Christ, this value is for what? It's for you who believe. It's for those who have faith that receive the full preciousness of this precious Savior the Lord Jesus Christ. And so precious faith allows us to see Christ as precious. It it allows us to see him for who he is and all of his glory and all of his fullness, to to appraise his value more and more, to be growing in this faith, our apprehension of his preciousness. And so it's a, a growing, refining faith that keeps seeing more of the fullness of Christ. And so to see who he is, to see what he has done for us. This isn't a demon faith that just believes doctrines and nods its head to what Christ said. But this faith is to see Christ, to see what he did, and to see a value in him and in the work that he has done for you. That is the precious faith that we will look at this morning. It's a faith that sees Christ as precious, that it sees him as a treasure hidden in a field. And every one of us who is a Christian to be able to say, I would sell all that I could have that field. All I want is Christ. He's the pearl of great price. That's faith. So the reason we're Christians, the reason we gather here together is because of our precious faith that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ and the promises and the hope that is laid up in that. I want you to listen to how Paul said this in 2 Corinthians 4. He said, even if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world, which is the devil, has blinded the minds of the unbelieving. And what's happened that he blinded their minds? That they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. They can't see the glory and the beauty of Jesus Christ. 
who is the image of God. So Paul says, we don't preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus is Lord, and ourselves as your due loss, as your bondservants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, light shall shine out of darkness, is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. And so we, he says, let there be light, and we can now see the beauty and the glory of Jesus Christ. Faith lets us see the unsearchable riches of Christ to begin a journey of seeing it clearer and more lovely all of our days till we see him face to face on that last day. So guys, as we look out at this world as Peter is doing, this world is hardening against the truth. There's a great moral decline and blatant sin that is just rising and growing and growing. There has been a reversal of right and wrong in our own land. We're parading sin around and glorying in it. False teaching is abounding and the church visible. And the selfishness of this world is absolutely astounding. The answer for Peter is to look again at your precious faith, which looks at the precious Savior. So he wants us to remember again in the midst of all of this, to to look again at your precious faith that looks at the beauty of Christ. And so this morning, what I want to do is I want to show you why your faith is so precious. I want to stir you up by way of remembrance again of how precious this faith truly is. So our outline is just, I'm going to give you six truths to reveal the precious gift of faith. And I pray when we're done that we will all just rise and worship our God for the greatest gift that could ever be given to a human. So let's begin with the first one, is how did we come to possess faith? How did we come to possess faith? How did you get this treasure? Where where does faith come from? It's a good question to ask. We don't even ask that question enough. Where does it come from? And the answers have just varied throughout church history. The origin of our faith is, the the two main views is that it, it, it doesn't originate from us. We muster it up or does it originate from God? And then we respond. What is the source or the soil of where faith comes from? And the simple answer is just, I believed. I believed that that must take place. You must believe to be saved. But why did you believe? Why did your twin sister reject it? Why is your brother hardened in unbelief? Why does your neighbor have no concern for Christ? What causes you to differ? And the answer is very important that we get this right. This is a big question because a lot of glory is at stake in how you answer this. Something is precious. It's so precious. If it originated with me, I've got something to boast in. Something this beautiful, if it started with me as its source, I've got something to pat myself on the shoulder. I was smarter than my neighbor, than my brother. I just always had a desire for moral excellence. I was just a good guy from day one. I'm like those escape rooms. You ever seen those things? Me neither. But I know people who do them and they say, if if you give me enough time, I will always figure something out. I'll always get it figured out. Just like faith, I just figured it out. So it causes you to differ than everyone else in the world. The bottom line answer then would be you. And I liked that answer for about five years after I got saved. And I made a mistake of going to seminary. And they made me open up my Bible to get the answer for this question instead of just what felt good. And it shattered my whole foundation. And it made me flush out my answer that I had never even given any thought about. And there's just a few problems with my old answer. Because since the fall of mankind, Ephesians 2 says you come in spiritually dead. You now come in separated from God. You come in wanting to be God, to call the shots and be the one. The Bible declares that we are spiritually blind. We can't see the things of God. 
Our minds were darkened in Ephesians 4, so we couldn't see the light of the glory of God in the face of Christ. We could read the Bible a hundred times over again and again and again and never see the glory of God in the face of Christ. Some of you sit here this morning, you've read your Bible maybe 30 times and you've never seen the glory of God in the face of Christ. That is possible. There are millions and millions this day reading the Bible, trying to live a good life to have God accept them. They can't see. Paul says they're always learning, but they never come to the knowledge of the truth, the the full knowledge that we're going to study here in 2 Peter, where you get it and you see it. Paul said in Romans 3, there's none who seek for God. In our fallen state, you will not truly seek after God unless something happens. So it's amazing to me that we can create so many things in our world today, but we can't create faith in a dead soul. We do not have the technology nor the power to create faith in a dead spiritual soul. Faith cannot grow up out of the natural soil of man's heart. In this heart, it can't grow the plant called faith. All that can come out is unbelief. That's the only thing that can come out of the the lost heart estranged from God is unbelief. We're like a man in the darkness. We don't know over what we stumble. We're just stumbling and we can't figure it out. We can't see the light of God. Look at the best minds in our world and their answers to the problems that everyone's beginning to see in our country is education, human empowerment. Let's make more laws. Let's come up with little slogans. Just say no to drugs. And we're trying everything we can and it's getting worse and worse and worse. And no matter how hard we try, throw money at it, uh, time at trying to fix the brokenness of this world, we can't fix the problem because we don't have faith. Romans 1 says we see creation, we know there's a God, and we suppress the truth. And it says we pretend to be wise, and we come up with all of these foolish ideas of the world's origins, and all of this is, is we, we just we don't want to deal with God, so we suppress it. Everything in the Bible teaches us that faith cannot originate from us. You you, you can't get it. You can't muster it up. You can't make it. Faith cannot come from a fallen, dead human heart separated from God. I want that to sink in. So what does it say then? Where does faith originate from? And I think our text this morning answers it very clearly where it should have no confusion at all. Look at verse 1. Simon Peter, a bondservant, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have what? Have received a faith of the same kind as ours. And so Peter makes it very clear that you received a faith. This is a a great Greek word. It literally meant to obtain by lot. And it was very famous in that day that they, they would cast lots for different things. Remember when they were doing it for Jesus' robes? And so the casting lots is, is the way that God would do divine providence and how he would lead and guide. Do you remember when they thought they needed another apostle and they, they did the lots uh, because of Judas? And so they did this so that God would providentially reveal his will. And so this faith, it, it's not attained by personal effort. It's not attained by skill. It's not attained by worthiness. It's not attained by your smarts. This faith, Peter says, came purely from God. He controlled the giving of it. All the lexicons that I studied say that this word means to gain by divine will. To to gain by divine will, him dispensing it, him choosing to give it to you so that you receive it. It's a gift. Here you go, receive it. Peter says, you believers received a faith because God willed it so. That one should keep you busy the rest of your days. Marveling and growing in your understanding of how precious this gift is that God gave to you. I can spend the rest of my days marveling that God gave me the gift of faith when there's just millions out here walking around without it. I don't want to do this. I want to do this to God be the glory. 
So faith is the capacity to believe and to trust God. I believe it, and therefore I trust the living God for what he says and what he did and what he will do. It isn't just, I nod nod my head to something, I get it, I believe it, and it causes me to act on it. And the truth of the gospel is you got to trust this sovereign God who's your father and for you. you. You trust him. You give him everything and you trust because he's God. I'm going to knock this thing off. I'm so excited. <laughs> Precious, isn't it? So I want you to hear just a few verses to see the analogy of Scripture that this is taught everywhere. Listen to Philippians 1.29. Paul said, For to you it has been granted for Christ's sake not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. You've been given the gift of faith and you've been given the gift to suffer for the name of Jesus Christ on the same level. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, as Robin read, for by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not as a result of works so that no one will ever be able to boast. If you have faith, there's nothing that you'll ever be able to boast in because it was a gift from God. Acts 13, 48, the Gentiles heard this preaching from Paul and they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord and as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. And repentance and faith being the same coin uh, in Acts 11, when they heard this, they quieted down and glorified God saying, well then, God has granted to the Gentiles, that's a gift, also the repentance that leads to life. God gives the gift of faith, and God gives the gift of repentance. Isn't it a gift to turn from your sin, to turn to the living God and believe? What a gift. And so what I want every believer in this room to see is I am what I am solely by the grace of God, who granted me faith as a gift. And so when I think about something being precious, What many times makes something the most precious is who gave it to you, right? That's when the tears begin to flow if you lose it or it's stolen. It's not so much the intrinsic value, but it's who gave it to us. A necklace that a mother gave to you and she's no longer on the earth and you lose it. That's precious because who gave it to you? And so what really makes something precious is the one who gave it. And in this case, God gave it to me. God gave me the gift of faith. My faith is the most precious thing I possess. You can take away anything else and I'll be okay. There could be some hard things. But but don't take away this precious gift of faith that God has given to me. That is the most precious thing that I have on this earth because it links me to the precious Christ. Amen? Amen? Second, the other thing that makes it precious, it's not just faith, but what is the object of my faith? And if you'll look at verse 1, it says, To those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours, by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Why am I a Christian? Because of the righteousness that is manifested in his beloved Son, the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ that's been manifested. This is how you know if you've, rece- if you've received faith. This is it. The Pharisees sought to establish a righteousness of their own. Okay? They, they could only look at salvation and look to the law and then look to their own hands. I've got to keep it. I've got to do these things so I can get right with God. So I I see a righteousness in God. I see a righteous standard that's required in his law. And I see religion and works as my way to this God, which is everywhere in our midst. I I, I see this righteousness. I see what he requires. So I'm going to get there. I'm going to work at it. I'm going to become righteous. The grace of almighty God is that he kills you to this way of righteousness. 
God to give you the gift of faith, the way he's going to do it, you just don't wake up and go, ha, he's going to kill you to your righteousness. He's going to kill that. In Romans 1, 17, it says the righteousness of God is revealed in this gospel. I've gone this before. It's a subjective genitive, which would be translated this way. A God kind of righteousness is revealed in this gospel. So God isn't saying, here's the righteousness that you got to go keep. He's saying in this gospel, I'm going to give you the righteousness that I require to be in my presence. And I'm going to give it by the way of my perfect, righteous son. The standard is perfection. I want you to hear this if you're looking to your hands. It's a perfect standard to be in the presence of God. That's what he requires. He can't have sin in his presence unpunished. The Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, you need to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. True faith looks at this holy and righteous God, and and you, you see it now. I used to just think he was a little better than me. And when you see it, you're you're undone. True faith now looks at self, and for the first time you see no escape in your own hands, your own wisdom, your own devising. You're like Abraham, I'm a hundred and I'm not going to have a child, there's no hope. True faith dies to any hope that you could ever fix this problem. This is how you know if God's granted you faith. There's a blazing holy righteousness to God that is unfathomable. I'll I'll be like a chip in the noonday sun if you stick me in his presence. And I look at myself and I don't see righteousness. And I can't fix it. I don't hold the key to fix this problem. You know what religion is? Religion is you fixing the problem. But faith looks away from anything in yourself to God's remedy and God's remedy alone, which is Jesus Christ. It looks only at the righteousness of Jesus Christ. True faith is an empty hand that receives the free gift of God. God demands perfect righteousness, and His grace is He will give it to you in His Son. True faith rests from its works. It quits looking to self-righteousness, and it rests in Christ's righteousness alone. That's how you know if you've received faith. You're not looking at your faith. You're looking at Christ and his blazing righteousness. And Isaiah says you're wrapped in his righteous garment, safe and secure from all alarms. And I want you to get this, that God's righteousness has to deal with your sin rightly. It has to deal with his justice to be righteous. God can't just wrap that robe around a filthy sinner. And God has a way of cleansing you righteously from all your sin. Faith looks at the Son of God then dying in your place on a cross. It looks to my sin. God can't just say, here, I'm going to wrap you in righteousness. No, my sin's got to be dealt with righteously by a righteous God. And I'm going to do it by a substitute. I'm going to put my son up there and I'm going to deal justly with him so I can deal mercifully with you. First Peter 1.18 says he shed his precious blood on our behalf. It was a precious blood that flowed from a precious Savior, and you get the gift of a precious faith to look at it. So why so precious? Because it looks at the precious blood of Christ flowing out for my sins, yes, even my sins. This is a gift that no man can muster it up. This is a gift to see this in such a way that Christ becomes precious. Your faith becomes the most precious thing you possess because with it, I lay hold of the precious Christ. God has made a way for me to hold. Next week, we're going to see the divine nature. I'm going to be able to have fellowship with this God. Do you see what he's given to you? Marvel, saints of God. The way this precious faith has come to you, it's come by the way of an incarnation, comes by the way of a crucifixion, comes by the way of a resurrection, and by an ascension, the right hand of God interceding on your behalf this morning. This is how the gift was wrapped 
for you. Your faith is in this, to receive the free gift of God that cost the Father his own precious Son for our salvation. You get this, and your life will be revolutionized, and you'll get verses 5 through 7, where you'll begin to have moral excellence, and you'll have perseverance, and, and you'll have a, a brotherly love and, and agape. These, these things will flow out from this. Peter wants to make sure you, you just can't get there to that without this. And so you've got to, by faith, lay hold of the glory and the beauty of this Christ. What do the lesser things that are coming against you this morning matter? In light of this, you have precious faith. Would you let that be the lifter of your head this morning? You have precious faith. Thirdly, sometimes what makes a gift precious as well is really the rarity of the treasure. When it's just so rare, that old cartoon, if everyone is special, then no one is special. As I look out at this world and my surroundings, there's just unbelief is abounding. It's everywhere. Hatred for God and the hatred for each other is just rising. You can't even drive on the road without getting it. The hatred toward each other and other races and the political parties is just nonsense. Just sickness, hatred growing and getting bigger and bigger. It does my soul good every Sunday to gather with you guys who have received a, a precious faith. It's like a family reunion every Sunday for me, but better. But if we had food, it would help. <laughs> but it's because we see the, the same thing as precious. And I love just seeing you because Christ is precious. And to gather in fellowship together because we, we have this like faith in a precious Christ. This is a rare gift, the gift of faith. Listen to what Jesus said. The end of the Sermon on the Mount, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and many are those who enter by it. But the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and few are those who find it. Many will enter destruction, and only a few will enter through this narrow gate, looking to what I just said, to Christ alone for your righteousness and the payment of your sin. Very few receive this gift. Jesus said, when the Son of Man comes back, will he even find faith on this earth? When I see how few people have this faith, so many have a demon faith. They just nod to these things and think orthodoxy makes them a Christian. It doesn't. It's a faith that sees the glory and the beauty of this Christ to where I just want to lay my life down and follow him. Don't be content with just academic knowledge. The demons have that and shudder, and none of them will be in glory. Those rare ones who have received the gift of faith that sees such a beauty in Christ that it's changing them from one image of glory to the next. Do you realize what a precious gift you have here this morning? Amazing love, how can it be? But thou, my God, shouldst die for me. Uh, Wesley said, I'm amazed that I can gain an interest in the Savior's blood, that he applied it to me, overwhelming this gift. And so, guys, it's a small company. Jesus said it's a small group, and you have it if you're a child of God. Be courageous then and lift your eyes up this morning. You have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus because God granted you faith. That gift of faith just gets the fullness of all that Jesus is. Faith in what he has done. It is finished. I rest in Jesus Christ and his work. Fourth, <clears throat> people with whom you share this precious gift makes it precious. He says, we've received in verse 1 the same kind as ours. You've received faith, the same kind as ours. We have the same faith then as Peter. Do you realize we have the same faith as Paul? Look at the company that this faith puts you in. We have this faith together. Listening to Sunday school, I was just like, I have the same faith in, as Robin Conwell and the Savior. I have the same faith as so many of you 
In this church, I've stood, I remember with uh, Russ and Flora Roars standing at their daughter's graveside and them worshiping God and praising. And it was the most beautiful thing. And I've done it with Joe and I've done it with so many of you. And to, to be in the same group, all the saints, Peter, James, and John, the inner three, I got the same faith. The martyrs who went to a stake and were burned because they wouldn't recant for their love for Jesus Christ. And, and we have that same precious faith. Hebrews 11 of Enoch and, and all the list of, of Hebrews 11, those who were sawn in two because they, didn't, they were, had a hope and a better resurrection. And David, and, and he just goes through this whole list. And here you are, that's your company. Those are your friends. All the reformers, Luther's and Calvin's and the Puritans who were so faithful and the Whitfields and Spurgeons. I got the same faith as George Mueller in his biography. He kept saying, I don't have a special faith. I have a special God that I just believe and I trust him. Guys, we have such a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us. Let us run the race then with endurance. What do we do? Fix our eyes on Jesus. What? Who's the author and the perfecter of faith. He gave it to you and he's perfecting it. Look at him as you run the race. What a cloud of witnesses around us that we've been brought into. What company I'm a part of. I'm not the company of this world. I'm not their choice. But I've received the same faith as the best that this world is not even worthy of. We belong to that company and we get the same blessings as them because we look to the same Christ. So I, I pray, lift your head up, Christian. Fifthly, this faith is most precious because of what it does for us. By faith, we are saved. By faith, we are reconciled to God. All the blessings of God now flow to us by faith. I could meditate on that phrase, every spiritual blessing for the rest of my life. Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places now has been given to us by faith. The Bible is the best-selling book of all time. Why are so, so few people Christians then? Because they don't have the gift of faith. You obtained it by divine lot. You received it. The natural man cannot understand the things of God. I got this old worn-out illustration and all the young kids look at me like I'm from another planet, but I'm going to do it anyways. When I was in high school, which were the best years ever, the 80s, the music was better, everything was good <coughs> in the 80s. And if you wanted to listen to music, all you got was AM. And all the good stations were FM as an unbeliever. I, I doubt that's true today. But you had to buy this special antenna. And if you put it on your car, you could get the FM reception. And so the gospel, it's, it's going out in FM. And, and you just don't get it. You don't get the frequency. It's not coming in. All I got is an AM antenna. I'm stuck. And the gospel is God comes and he puts that FM antenna right in your heart. And now I get the reception of Jesus Christ and all that he is. And I'm singing his praises. Thank you, God, for giving me an antenna that now I can receive data and knowledge and wisdom of who this Jesus Christ is, and I want to lay down my life for him. The world can't see this as a treasure. But you, dear Christians, you have been given eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to believe, to sell all that you might to have this field, this diamond. The gift of faith to see the truth in Christ and to respond in repentance and belief and be justified. Listen to what Paul wrote. More than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I've suffered the loss of all things. And I count them but rubbish in order that I might gain Christ, that I might be found in him not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. Is there anything in this world more precious than faith? It opens up the storehouses of heaven, it justifies us, it sanctifies us, and it brings us into grace that we can grow in it next week. 
But Peter says in verse 9, For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you that you've received faith. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Christ will be abundantly supplied to you. When you die, friend, everything will be wide open to you. Abundantly supplied because of this faith. Your soul, guided by faith, will open up into an abundant harbor. The sweet gift of faith. And lastly, how does God give this gift? Does God just kind of do an end around what we call free will? How, 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 do you, how does he give it to you? And so what I, what I want you to see is so many people get confused and just say, well, you know, I, I thought I believed. And yes, you have to believe to be saved. But I want to show you now how this whole thing comes together in one verse. In John 1, 12. But as many as received him, to, get, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. Everyone who will receive him, everyone who will believe in him will be saved. Who can believe and who can receive him, he tells us in the next verse. Those who were born not of blood, not your being Jewish, nor of the will of the flesh, your free will, nor of the will of man, but of God. And in 2 Corinthians 4, he said, let there be light. And light shines in and you see the glory of God in the face of Christ. And now your faith sees this and your faith believes in Jesus Christ. So you must receive Christ. You must believe. That's the gift of faith. That's how you know. But the only one who will ever see a value in Christ and believe this and die to self and look to the finished work and love Jesus Christ are those who will be born of God. And then the most freeing, free thing you've ever done in your life, the freest thing I've ever done, is to come to Jesus and surrender everything, to believe upon him. It was the freest thing. God didn't make my will do that. He opened up and showed me that treasure to where I was so willing I had to come to Christ and receive him and believe and find his fullness. There's the beauty of how God works this faith into us who have received that gift. But apart from that, in your natural state, you would have never, ever come to faith. So I guess my last point, it's not in your outline, this one's for free, is if you're here this morning and you don't have this gift of faith, what you need more than anything now then is to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. To quit looking to cleaning up being a good person, going to church, trying to just get everything right, that's, that's going to die. And your only hope is a perfect righteousness. And in this gospel, God is willing to give you his own sons and put that to your account so that now God will look at you as if you're perfectly righteous this morning. And your sin has to be punished. For one sin, you're guilty of breaking the whole law of God. And he put his son up on a cross and he put our sins and he didn't spare his own son and he poured out his full wrath on the son of God so that he could show you mercy. And so this morning you need to believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. Let's pray. Father, the depth of the riches both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are your judgments and unfathomable your ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has become your counselor or who has first given to you that it might be paid back again For from you and through you and to you are all things to you be the glory forever. Amen. God, we thank you for this most precious gift of faith. I pray that your spirit through your word has caused everyone in this room to treasure it a little greater. Lord, it's so precious what it opens up to us. We thank you for this amazing gift and we will spend the rest of our days worshiping you that you freely bestowed it upon us when we were haters and sinners and not seeking you but seeking our own self. Amazing grace, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me?
The preceding message was presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado, and we hope you've been challenged and encouraged to grow in your relationship with Christ. Each week, our sermons are made available online and may be downloaded and distributed. If you have questions or comments or would like to speak to one of our pastors, please contact us through our website at southsidebible.org.